the uh, recording progress. Yeah. What, what the composition of the meeting would be. So I would start off with a very simple introduction to the paradigm with which we are going to talk about. It is the famous uh, Posner spatial theory paradigm. Uh, it was uh, uh, posed by the great Mike Posner, who is one of the big names in vision psychology as well. Where does he have origin? Uh, and uh, this is a very important uh, paradigm, especially in neuropsychology, to make assessments for patients as well. So it's a, uh, it's not simply a, a curious thing for basic science research. It's also employed by people in the clinical world. So it has very, very important consequences. So briefly, uh, the Posner paradigm is broken up into like endogenous mm -hmm. and exogenous cues. Uh, they are. All you have to do is you're fixating in the middle of a screen. There might be two stimuli or more, but for simplicity, let's say there are just two stimuli on either side of the visual hemifield. You're either given a valid cue, which says that at some point, a stimulus might occur in that location or a stimulus might change in that location. And uh, when the stimulus change does happen, you have to either press a button really fast or make an eye movement really fast and uh, your reaction times are recorded. A valid trial or is one where the cue is in the, in the location where the stimulus gets present individually, and the invalid one is where the cue is, is present opposite to where the stimulus will eventually be presented. Mm -hmm. This is called an endogenous cue because you're presenting it in the fixation spot, so you're not asking people to covertly be attending to the location while, you're, while the cue is being presented. In the exogenous cue version, th there is no endogenous cue like an arrow or something. Uh, this location is highlighted saying, pay attention to this area. And if there is a valid cue, uh, stimulus will appear there. And then you make a saccade or a press a button or whatever. And the same goes for the invalid cue. And this was used by very many people uh, uh, after Posner to study in the world of psychophysics, reaction times of people, uh, reaction times in valid and invalid trials, and then there's something called those neutral trials. So uh, we were able to get a good sense of how, what is the level of attentional engagement of people where with respect to the spatial attentional paradigm. And of course, later we have the feature attention ideas in visual search and all that. The motivations were primarily in this uh, Posner paradigm, uh, to sort of separate the overt eye movement related shifts in attention from the covert aspect of how you're attending to a target without any involvement of your eye movements. So that was the reason why this paradigm was introduced. Uh, because in naturalistic viewing tasks, you can imagine that I'll be looking at something and then I'm interested in something else. I'll shift my attention and my shift in attention comes with a eye movement. And if you really want to study the cognitive component versus the eye movement component, you kind of want to separate it. So I think this was a necessary first step, but I think over the course of my talk, I'm going to say we should start refining this idea. That's my goal over here. Um, so everyone on board with the Posner paradigm because it's very, very crucial. And this is what everyone in neurophysiology has adopted as their <laughs> methodology to study attention. And this is why Jeremy is like, uh, I'm not paid. He is, he is simply being too humble here. Because uh -huh. whenever these people introduce all these very important paradigms in spatial attention or visual search, that's what we use in neurophysiology physiology to study and understand the neural parts of it, which are uh, like a black box for the people who do psychophysics. So any cue that's not coincident with the location that you want the person to attend to is, is an endogenous cue? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, roughly. <laughs> um, because this is more, uh, because this is not like related to any stimulus feature or anything, it's just locational. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Um, before we go into my task, this is the neurophysiologist, uh, this is just a cartoonish schematic. I'll present actual results soon. Uh, this is the neurophysiologist taking up the mantle of uh, the Posner paradigm and what they have done with it. Uh, and uh, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, my boss, uh, Bob Desimone, he did pretty much most of the early work 
in the neurophysiology of attention and trying to find the neural correlates of uh, attention, especially in areas V4 to some extent in V1 and then in IT cortex as well. I'll be presenting data from V4 and IT2. Uh, broadly, uh, the paradigm is the positive paradigm. You're fixating, you will be presented as similar in one of two locations. Uh, this box is the receptive field of the neuron that you're measuring from the monkey brain. Uh, if an object falls within the receptive field, you should elicit some neural response in that brain area. Uh, and they wanted to study what happens when I present different stimuli in those areas. So let's say that in the schematic, a red bar, which is horizontally oriented, is the thing that these neurons in these areas prefer the most. Um, so I just call it the good stimulus. And when you pay attention to it, you see that the post presentation of that stimulus, you see the highest like firing rate in the neuron that in V4. On the other hand, I could present a stimulus that the neuron actually doesn't prefer, say a, a, a slanted yellow bar. And that's not the neuron's preferred stimuli. You will see an activity which looks like those very low firing rate in yellow over here. And then if I ask you to attend, to this poor stimuli within the receptive field, I can present multiple stimuli within the same receptive field of the neuron and ask you to attend only to the uh, yellow stimulus by cueing you. The endogenous cue would be here by saying like, look at only the yellow colored thing and not the red colored thing. You see something interesting. There is some enhancement, but it's still very, very low. On the other hand, this is the good stimulus and this is the bad stimulus. When I ask you to attend to the good stimulus in the presence of the bad stimulus or a poor stimulus, uh, the effect that you see is somewhere in the middle. That's what I meant by the pair over here. Mm -hmm. What this is, this served as the basis for what they call as the bias competition model in uh, neural networks and neural modeling, which is that when there are multiple competing features or stimuli in a given the field, they're all, there is a competition in the neural network. And so it's not going to be the big good attend stimulus over here, or it's going to be something over here, it's going to be somewhere in the middle and the competition will decide it. And of course, after that, Bob and John Reynolds came up with their ideas of normalized uh, normalization and so on. So, so this is like very broadly the schematic or cartoonish picture of what, uh, how people have employed this Posner paradigm in uh, neurophysiology. And of course we have to add a little more things that uh, are very obvious for us in the human world. For example, I can't simply cue an animal to an empty location and make a saccade and expect a, a responses to be elicited. So unlike the Posner paradigm, I need a stimulus always present at some location. Uh, otherwise, there is no response in the neurons. It's just baseline firing rate. Um, so yeah, having said all that, this is the attention task that my animals are engaged in. These are macaques. We have extensively trained uh, several years of uh, my life. <laughs> uh, uh, and I've recorded from three primary areas. Uh, one is the extrasthyroid cortex, area V4, uh, and then the temporal cortex, inferior temporal cortex, IT cortex, and the lateral nucleus of the pulvinar. I will present, uh, which is the lateral nucleus of the pulvinar for most people is a subthalamic, is, is a thalamic structure. It is funnily the largest thalamus in both primates and humans, yet it is the least studied. Everyone knows about LGN and all that, but the pulvinar is way bigger and the pulvinar has extensive connections to almost every part, every, the, there are different sections of the pulvinar nucleus. I'm only looking at the lateral nucleus. There's also the medial and the inferior nucleus. It's extensively connected to all parts of the brain, of the cerebral cortex, and it's involved, it's definitely implicated in almost every attentional syndrome that you can think of. Any lesion to the pulvinar will have some attentional deficit in the human or the monkey. Uh, but our understanding of it is very, very little in comparison to what we know about the other nuclei of the thalamus like LGN or MGN and so on. Uh, so yeah, the, the recordings are from these three areas. The task again is uh, uh, a variation of the Posner paradigm. Uh, I'll just describe one, one of it, uh, they're the same. Uh, the monkey is staring at an empty screen that is a fixation. Um, the fixation window is a tiny two by two degree window. Uh, it's very, very tiny. Uh, and then in the 
paraphobial part of the uh, monkey's vision about five to 10 degrees eccentricity from the fixation. We present a, a stimulus array, usually three objects. They are all randomly chosen from these seven sets of objects. Okay. Uh, the stim in, the, in this case, where I call it the stim first, Q second sessions, the stimulus appears first. And then after a certain period of time, the Q appears in one of the three locations, which is the location that the animal must attend to without moving its eyes. So it's fixating for this entire by roughly 2,400 milliseconds maximum time period, which is a very long time period in an attention task. So this is a sustained attention task. <clears throat> and then whenever the animal detects a change in the cued location, which might be a bright color change, the animal has to immediately make an, an eye movement to that location. When that animal does that, this trial ends, it gets a juice reward, rinse repeat. We do this again and again and again. Okay, and the queue is at different locations. So this is just one location. It could be queued here. It could be queued here. So one of three locations is what the animal is queued to. We do hundreds of trials every day, and we record from that. Is it a hundred percent valid queue or? or... Uh, no, it's not hundred percent. It's eighty twenty. Uh, but I'm going to show. Only going to be showing the valid trial results. But there are there are yes. foil there are targets. There, there are foil targets. There are also distractors. Uh, I'm not going to be showing any of those results. Uh, so what I mean by distractor is before even this uh, locations of color change happens, I might actually distract the animal by changing color in another location. The animal has to suppress that, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the, the it's saccad to that location and only saccad to the location where it has been queued to. So, uh, but yeah, all valid trials are what I'm going to be showing you. Uh, and this is the stim first queue second, but I'm also have sessions where I press in the queue first and then the stimulus. Uh, and these are just to see whether there is a component of the stimulus onset response and so on. Uh, this is very standard in neurophysiology to see what's the neural effects. Um, so we have about, I have 18 sessions of this and 16 sessions of this, so 34 sessions with two monkeys, a uh, few hundred neurons in V4, ID, and pulvinar. Uh, that's the results I'm going to be presenting. And is the magnitude of the change so subtle that if you're not attending to that region, you're not going to be able to pick yes. up. Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is not like some bright mm -hmm. big flash. Uh, it's very isolated. You have to pay attention. Otherwise, you like I tried it. I miss it. All. <laughs> the mm -hmm. monkeys are better than me. <laughs> <laughs> are these objects always in the same place? Or uh, it no no no. Uh, yeah. It varies depending on every session, depending on where I. I first map the receptive fields of the neuron that I of the neurons that I'm interested in before I can actually like place them in. This is just the schematic, but more or less it will be depending on the animal on one hemisphere. It'll be on one side of it because I'm measuring from the other side of the brain. So, for example, one of the animals had the uh, implants on its left hemisphere, the other on the right hemisphere. So it'll be the contralateral side of the four. Uh, that's where that's the visual field for these animals. So in one monkey, it will be left or right. And the locations will change, will definitely be on the one of the hemifields, but they might change after I do the receptor field mapping. Uh, so they might actually move around. That is my first. They might kind of like go move around. They might be a little further up, further down, further away. That's all possible. But you don't you don't put um, distractors in the contralateral field. Uh, I do too. Oh, okay. I do too. I mean, I'm just like, you know, in this, this case, this is just as, uh, in fact, like one of the things that I'm not showing is you also did pulvinar lesions. Um, if I don't do these uh, contralateral stimuli, the animal has complete hemifield neglect. So, like, I won't get any character eyes at all. Like, the animal won't perform. It's just struggling to move its eyes whatsoever. Uh, was that right? With an arthritis uh, lateral effect? Not, not the lateral one. The one with medial pulvinar injections is like complete in a field. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, uh, yeah, this study is no lesions, nothing. I'm just presenting vanilla. Like everything is fine. The animal is working well. Let's see what happens. Uh, Again, like now I immediately shifted it to this side. So th th just think of this as schematic. Uh, it's not exactly the location. It changes section by section, animal by animal. So this is a, the very standard attentional modulation result that you will see in any paper on attentional modulation in V4, which is that, so these new, these this location where this, this object is present is where the receptive field 
of the neurons I'm measuring from. Like these are the neurons where whose receptor fields are mapping to this location over here. Where is my cursor? I can't see it. Yeah. Um, so this is the location where the receptor fields of the neuron is. And I'm going to call that attention in. That's how we're going to separate it. And the one that is like the most extent, uh, distant extent from it, I'm going to call that the attention out area. So that's what we want to contrast. We want to see what is the neurophysiological effects of or signatures of attention for this set of neurons, which have a receptive field in the uh, receptor, within the receptive field in the attention end. And these neurons have no receptive field for inputs in these locations. Like if I flash just an input there, There'll be no firing in the neurons at all. It'll just be baseline firing. It'll just be Poisson spikes. Uh, we also have controls where we're just looking at one location and then firing. So that's how we mm -hmm. estimate what's the baseline firing and so on. So here, in your experience, how small can these, uh, how close can these regions be and not uh, interact? Uh, uh, they can be pretty close. Uh, we make make it very uh, when we do our surgeries and our chambers we are very careful in trying to more or less isolate one of the quadrants as the areas mm -hmm. where the receptive field of all these neurons will be mm -hmm. so it's mostly restricted to one of the lower quadrants or the upper quadrants where you will find the receptive field of these neurons uh, that's a that's something that we have to de decide beforehand otherwise it's like we can't open up a very big area in V4. So we have to be very, this is all because of taking care of the animal, not having infections, not making a big craniotomy, all that stuff. So we have to be very careful with that. Um, so this is a paper, which was like the first of the works that pe people did in our lab with respect to pulvinar cortex interactions. My work is a continuation of that in very many different ways. Um, and the results from this paper are the standard results that you will see in uh, attention modulation. So the top part is uh, neurons in V4. Again, attention all through my presentation, attention in will be in red and attention out will be in blue. So please just remember that these are the two different locations. Um, what you see is that after the cue was presented, the stimulus comes on. And then there is this initial transient input response is like a rimples response to the whole system. It's just flushing it with input data. Uh, and then after a while, you see that, uh, it's, yeah, you see that there is a separation that happens after a while, about 115 milliseconds is what they have marked. That's the latency time after which the attentional separation clicks in. That is the one that you're attending to is way more active than the one which you're not attending to. Because the stimulus is always present in mm -hmm. all three locations. Mm -hmm. It's not like, uh, I'm, I'm, so what it means is now I'm attending in the blue, mm -hmm. I'm attending to the apple, but I'm still measuring from neurons which are looking at the part over here. Mm -hmm. So it's saying that despite the fact that you're very, uh, there is a stimulus there, the activity is lower there because you're not paying attention. It's mm -hmm. enhancement because there is also attention paid to it. That difference is the neural correlate or signature of attention. So whatever you see here is the neural correlate or signature of attention within the receptive field, okay? And yeah, they can extend it to multiple sec uh, whatever time period in multiple seconds. And this is right before the target color change happens, this section, which is after a variable time of anywhere from 1.5 seconds to 2.4 seconds. Uh, the same kind of idea is also replicated in Palvinar, but much lower in terms of the average firing rate. Uh, so this is like the standard uh, picture of how you do the neurophysiological correlates of attention. Okay. Now you'll start questioning like, what on earth am I talking about with respect to microsaccades and all that stuff and, uh, you know, the Boston paradigm. So uh, that's what I'm going to be telling you about. That's the main story here. But before that, again, for a complete uh, completeness, I'll briefly talk about microsaccades. There are some experts here. They know more about it, but uh, for other people, uh, microsaccades have been known for quite a long period of time in the field. Uh, if other, anyone doesn't know it, all I would say is like, if you can focus on the red dot, uh, just, just fixate on the red dot. Maybe if you stare and write in front of the screen will be a better option. Um, the entire ring around it will disappear. 
if you're just fixating on the red dot, the entire ring around the stimulus will completely disappear. Mm -hmm. The only way you can get back, does it tell you for you, you're sitting straight ahead? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a famous uh, thing, Fox was German, uh, in okay. at 19th century, early 19th century, even before the Gestaltists and others, uh, he, he discovered this. And the only way you can actually recover the stimulus is if you either move your eyes pretty big, which is your saccades, or make very tiny micro saccades, tiny saccades, which are micro saccades. So that's the only way you'll be able to again see that halo ring. What it is, is I think the gestal people call it the Gansfeld effect, is that if there is a uniform, non static, non moving stuff and you fix it, the world disappears basically. So in the absence of external movement, you have to generate internal movement within you to actually uh, refresh the world that you see. So that's what proxless fading is kind of hinting at. Um, and so micro saccades and saccades are the way to uh, sort of refresh that sensory input. And of course, uh, if people have not seen this, this is one of probably the most famous studies ever to have come out in psychology from the Soviet Union. Uh, the famous psychologist named uh, Alfred Yarbus. Uh, he did a bunch of experiments on the relationship between eye movements and vision. Uh, some of those experiments are very, uh, I, I don't think any IRB or CAC or anyone will allow, allow you to perform right now. The, he put a suction cup and then uh, people seen Clockwork Orange, the, the movie, where they put that guy and make him watch, but uh, he can't close his eyelid. That's how they did it. Uh, I remember Charlie wanting to do something very similar and I had to like discourage him from doing it. <laughs> um, he, he came quite close to doing it. I, I know. He had a contact lens with a shard of glass. I, he told me about it. That's when I told him about Newton's story of him inserting a botkin, in a needle into his eyes to see how refraction works. It yeah. apparently hurt him for three days, but he inserted a, a needle into his lens. That's how crazy Newton was. Uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, Yarbus did these famous sets of experiments where he tracked the eye movement. These were the electro, what, what are they called? Uh, we do. We use modern infrared eye tracking devices. He had these motors on the sides of these suction so that they would measure precisely the, the the direction in which the eyes are moving. And so he was able to get the traces of the movement pattern of the eye on the visual field. So I, my understanding was that the contact lens had a little mirror on it. So essentially, using the technique that Charlie was trying out, mm -hmm. and the bright beam of light was being shown onto yep. that mirror. And this little reflection was in was based on the yeah. based on an unexposed. But he did two of them. He also had like uh, motors which will pick up the electrical signal on the I direction know. of the voltage difference, and he used that as well. So it's oh, both. both. Yeah, he did both. Uh, so yeah, in in his studies, he saw two types of pattern, which is kind of um, remarkable if you think about like all he said was scan this person's face. How would you like you know, take it's a free viewing task basically? He said like. I'm showing you a picture, please uh, view it. And then this is how most people tend to view it. They look at the eyes, the nose, the prominent things. That's how we are able to identify that it's a face. What you find here is that there are large saccadic eye movements. These are these long movements that you see. And then in the eye part, it's like really, really tiny movements. These are what are called as micro saccades. As the term suggests, it is indeed a micro saccad. But something happened after Yabus. We don't know what. Uh, micro saccade became a completely different idea. Uh, uh, and this is from Susanna Martinez Condi and Steve Macknick. They're very prominent neuroscientists and they've also done a lot of work on magic and uh, the neuroscience of magic and so on. Um, I don't want to say like no one, everyone treats micro saccades with disdain. There are some very, very prominent people who actually also take it seriously. Uh, um, Martin Escondi and uh, Macnick and a few other people who've uh, kind of tried to resurrect the importance of microsecans. Uh, this is also Yarbis' study, but this is from one of their papers where they actually want to talk about active vision and how humans do uh, perceive the world. So this is the picture that people were given to examine. Okay, This B, A, A over here, this picture, 
is the free viewing uh, eye movement of the people, who, that one subject who was looking at it. Okay. This is how they were looking at it. And you can clearly see they were looking at the faces, they were looking at the shoes, they were looking at the windows, they were like trying to slowly scan the world. So they're sampling by scanning and able to get a good see a sense of the scene that they are looking at. You said it's a single state, one subject? Or this is one subject. Average over this is one subject. Uh, and here is something very interesting. These are just the eye traces or the scan paths like that people like to call. These are for different instructions given by Argus to them. they will be like, what are those people looking at? You will get a different response. What are those people wearing? You'll get a different response. Mm -hmm. What is it, as is the material wealth in this room, you'll get a different response. Mm -hmm. So you see that the scan pads vary depending on well, what the objective was. And then you will see micro saccades and saccades interleaved in terms of how they operate. So this is our very naturalistic viewing condition. But as I said, something really, really crazy happened and I still don't know what happened. Uh, micro saccades are not talked about in this manner. This is the definition of a micro saccad. This is also from Wikipedia. This is also from um, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia. This is the definition of a micro saccad. So small with typically amplitudes less than about a degree, jerk-like, most importantly, involuntary fixational eye movements that occur during prolonged visual fixation in most animals or mammals with foveal vision. It has been known to be important for retinal image stabilization, like the one that I showed you with the proxless fading, or to enhance fine details, like if I were to look at around the eye and I have to make really tiny movements. And of course, the only cognitive world where they say micro saccades are very important is when they ask you about, in the reading literature, how you skip a word or how you read a word and how fast you read a word. You see people say that it's important. But outside of that, most people just treat it as an artifact. It is not treated as a micro saccade. It's treated as like a separate entity entirely. It's just random jerky eye movements that are required because we have a flawed biological evolution, evolved system. So that's how most people treat it. I'm not saying everyone, but most. And the fun trivia, it's uh, Robert Darwin, who was one of the first people to empirically um, record the existence of microsaccades. We still don't, uh, yeah, so that's all for microsaccades. Now I'll go you into said, my- You said it's treated right. that way until when? Right. When and does the, uh, the, like, the perspective- from, from 70s onwards, you look at the literature and when people look at microsaccades, they're like, yeah, that's not involved in anything. Until uh, or, or not involved in anything uh, other than, than dealing with the fact it stabilizes. It stabilizes. You will see that very. Un it unstabilizes the, the image. Yeah. So, Except for this yeah. retinal image stabilization aspect, you will not see people talk about it in any other uh, regard. It also depends a lot on what you decline, what, what you declare to be a micro saccade. The, 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 the artifact that was being uh, dismissed as having no functional role was basically tremor. And but then it kind of added on everything else. Well, there was a micro saccades in recent years. He's laughing. <laughs> Charlie is going to say that that's also not an artifact. <laughs> that, that, well, it's not, not an artifact made it useful, but, but you know, anyway, it, it, it helped when micro saccades got bigger. Yep. That people suddenly decided that uh, a one degree thingy was a micro saccade. Yep. Whereas we would have thought that was a huge regular old saccade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's kind of funny because like, it's not just the Arbus. Uh, there is a famous paper from a guy who worked in NIH, Zuber. He actually did this characterization of saccades at all amplitudes and uh, velocities. That's starting from like about 0.1 degrees all the way up to like your regular saccades. And he said that is in terms of amplitude, profile, everything, I find no difference. It's just a continuum. That's a very big paper in the 60s, right after the Arbo studies. So he had like a three, series of three papers, three, four papers, all in science. Mm -hmm. um, and then something happened. No one, like, everyone's like, eh, just don't treat it as being useful. Um, so, yeah. But this transition do, from think to set. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do, do the uh, micro cicades occur in drift and darkness? Yes. Yes. They do. They do. Uh, but I'm not sure whether. Uh, yeah, they do. Yes. 
but there is also a big difference between drift and micro saccades. So it's like you have to think about micro saccades as just tiny saccades. That's the best way to think about it. drifts are slightly different. Uh, drifts, you will see them uh, like they don't have that jump that you see with the saccade. Drifts have the smoother motion to them. Mm. Uh, so we do separate a drift from a, a micro saccade. Uh, so I would say, uh, yeah, maybe not in the dark. Uh, I have not seen it. I don't. I want to be careful. I don't want to say I know it. Uh, so I'll reserve it. Maybe I'll I'll find out something and then I'll email you guys if I do find whether drifts micro saccades occur in the dark. So this notion of there being a continuum from the very smallest saccades, the micro saccades, to the long, the conventional saccades. So along this continuum, is there a categorical boundary where things go from being involuntary to what? No, that's the claim that Zubair said was is, is a false uh, dichotomy. Mm -hmm. He said it's, it isn't. But somehow, this is what I, I've, I've, I've been trying to do my historical sleuthing to find out whether where this occurred. And I'm still like uh, struggling to see when this became this involuntary idea. Mm -hmm. uh, he thinks they are all on a spectrum. There is no voluntary versus involuntary. In fact, very recently, Ziad Hafid, who was one of the guys who has carried this forward, uh, he had a very uh, quite quite remarkable paper in like, 2020 or 2019, I don't remember exactly. Uh, he did something called as a memory guided micro saccades, very, very precise micro saccades in exactly the location and direction you wanted. And they could be as small in amplitude as 0.2 degrees. Hmm. And this was done in monkeys and humans, and they didn't take any time. So there's no random aspect to these eye movements. That's part of the claim that people like Ziad Hafed and Crosliss and we are making right now. So uh, yeah, so that's our push. <laughs> okay, so all, all this said and done, now we're going to talk about what happens when we start looking at micro saccades during these 2.4 second, 1.7 to 2.4 second sustained attention time periods in the attention task that I presented. Uh, so here is just a simple example. This is actually real data, but this is just one trial just to motivate you what we are trying to do over here. So the cue comes on first. This is the cue first stim second paradigm that I showed you. The cue comes on and then the stimulus comes on. You do the change detection, et cetera. So the cue comes on, the animal is making it's the vertical and horizontal eye positions that we're measuring, X and Y positions. Mm -hmm. And the stimulus and cue come on, and this is our attention period. It starts from the stimulus and cue together. That's our attention period until the change happens. And we, what we do is we detect micro saccades in this time period. You can see that are about, like, this is a good, easy trial. So I can say like there are one, two, three, four, four uh, micro saccades, okay? And we'll, we can also look at the directions of the micro saccade. Here is the funny part. If the micro saccade was so random, the direction of the micro saccade should be all over the map, okay? This is just, you can say like, this is just one trial. And I get this, it goes towards the target and then it goes away from the target. If the target was queued in this location, it goes towards the target or away from the target. That's just four micro saccades within that time period, okay? You could say this is a random thing. It could have happened just in this one trial. And if it is random, the direction of the micro saccade should be all over the place. But that's not what we observe if I take one session example. Like if I were to cue the animal to this location over here, which is the first one I show, this is all the micro saccade that that animal has made in that session, they either go towards the target or away from the target back to the fixation. If the animal was targeted was as was cued to attend to this target over here. Mm -hmm. It's doing this back and forth motion in this direction. Again, similarly in the other location as well. This is like almost every session, on and on and on. This is where we were like, come on, this can't just be like not doing something. We should test what's happening over here. And yeah, before I finish, this is just the distribution for the micro saccades for that entire session. Um, and this follows through for all the sessions as well, roughly. Uh, you see something that is roughly about three to four microsaccades a second, roughly speaking. Uh, I don't want to say that they're all average results. Microsaccades are not occurring in any periodic manner, but on average, there is a periodicity of about three to four microsaccades. Uh, and 
I'll, I don't want to say much about it because I think that, that gets into complications with people who want to talk about rhythmic sampling of attention and theories like that. Uh, we kind of have, a, I, at least I have a very different picture about how attention works if I were to consider it in a temporal domain. I don't think the rhythmic sampling thing really works. Sampling works, but not rhythmic sampling. So I'll, I'll reserve judgment on that. Um, so this is what you keep seeing session after session after session in either of the monkeys. Whichever direction it was skewed to, if you, if you accumulate all the trials where the direction animal was skewed to this lower location, it's this back and forth. I'm not saying it's exactly back and forth. It's a very narrow channel. It's not like if it was random, it should have been distributed through the entire uh, plot over here. We never find one. In fact, the only time I find it is when I lesion my palmina and the animal's microsaccades are gone haywire. And the animal is not required to eventually make a saccade. It will make a saccade. Otherwise, the trial doesn't get completed. So the change detection will happen. Yeah. And then the animal has to make a saccade. That's when if, the... you, if you didn't have that requirement. So I'm trying to get at whether the micro saccades are anticipatory mini movements. It could be. Of it could be. Period. But then the animal is uh, my, making micro saccades all the time in the sense that even after, immediately after the stimulus comes on, it's making it. And by the the fact that the animal has learned, I don't know, over three years of mm. training that it's like really, really long time period before mm. a change is going to occur. Why would the animal be making a micro saccade mm. uh, as just pure anticip anticipation of when the change will occur? So, mm. so the saccades in the opposite direction are presumably corrective saccades to get you back to fixation. Yes. Um, is it interesting that they are, uh, that, that they seem to average smaller or it is interesting, uh, yeah, but we have not looked at it yet in any detail because I think this is still a very, I would say this is our first course level of understanding, uh, but I think it so is interesting. But you've got a strong task demand here, which is the monkey, if he drifts out of the circle, out, out of the fixation, he's going to the trial his juice. Yeah, the trial so, collapses. So he's got to gotta yeah. keep an eye on where his eye is. Yes. And so if he's... If he, discovers he's cheating towards the target, he needs to uh, saccade back. The animal kind of, it's very hard for the animal to know exactly where the window is uh, of where he breaks. We usually never see the animal breaking a trial by breaking. Yeah, yeah, but he knows that he can. Kind, he's got yeah, to keep yeah, yeah. fixating on that. Yeah. yeah, so there's a... There is a very strong component for him to like... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and these are either, if, if you record the just the main sequence. I don't know if you've done it with these monkeys, but the, the, the main sequence of saccades just letting the monkey loose, would you get the same sort of temporal distributions? Presumably, uh, yes. I mean, that's just yeah. a standard yeah. saccadic rate of three or four per second. Yes. Even, even I mean, again, this three to four seconds is very natural, even in a naturalistic viewing setting. You're right about I should have mentioned that. That's why it's quite important. Uh, you like humans do this all the time. You make people uh, do a free viewing task and then just measure how often they move their eyes. It's roughly in the same rate. Uh, so the animal is kind of doing the same thing, even in this very so-called artif artificially constrained uh, setting as well. It's sort of like you can say, think of it as like this ecological thing where it's like, you have forced me into this, but I'm going to make use of every mechanism I have in my uh, arsenal to make, to make make this attention thing work for me. So, <laughs> well, or or... I'm going to have to deal with the fact that I have a mechanism <laughs> yep. that fires off an eye movement uh, yep. three or four times a second. And even though I don't want to make any, oh, crud, it's still doing that. <laughs> and I better keep track of whether yeah, I'm, that I'm in the window. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Karthik, sorry not to delay your, your presentation, but if you were to take a free viewing animal, so looking at an, a random thing, making the cards, if you were then to condition your analysis of the micro saccades by the saccades that the animal makes, do you think there would be any dependence of the direction of the micro saccades leading up to a larger saccade? Ah, so that's uh, Jeremy's territory with visual search there, right? Mm -hmm. So it's much, much harder. The only reason why I can do this here is I have a time, the mm. window is long enough for me to make any understanding about the, visual, the, the, the neural activity. It's very difficult mm -hmm. to say how fast the micro saccade occurs and then I jump off into some other, like, it's so difficult I, unless I'm enforcing the animal 
to say you have to actually ponder a bit on that object that you're looking at in the visual search before you make, make an eye movement. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to train an animal to do that. In <laughs> fact, like Narcisse Bichot, who's like the main guy in our lab who does all the visual research stuff, uh, we do see microsaccad uh, in the target and mm -hmm. the animal dust, but it's too fast. So it's very hard for us to understand how similar or different the neural activity will be. Mm -hmm. we, can't, we can't make a, a comparison in any meaningful mm -hmm. moment. Yeah, these are just hard uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, experimental questions because of the animal that we've chosen. Maybe if we were to do with humans, it's possible we can just instruct them to say, mm -hmm. like, doesn't matter when you make a, uh, when you land on the object, please stay there for a few seconds. I can instruct that. Animals, you know, they just want to get to the reward and the juice and mm -hmm. get on with the next trial. So, uh, was there any recorded results in the literature that talks about this, you know, correlation, this directional correlation? Directional uh, correlation between saccades and microsaccades. Uh, again, yeah, there is some. Uh, I would say, again, Ziad Hafed and Bridget Crosley are the two people who have done work on that line. And they have shown that there is yes. correlation. Yes. Okay, so Again, this is just to prime you before I'm going to be presenting all the neural data. Uh, now I'm going to expand it. It's no longer going to be just attention in, attention out. Now it's also going to be attention in, attention out, and then the direction of the microsaccad that will be labeled with that towards the target or away from the target. So you'll now see instead of two plots, blue and uh, red, you'll see four plots of blue and red, which are separating between the towards and the away. Okay. Um, and because, oh, before that, I, sh I, I will say one thing uh, before I present it. It's not like people didn't try looking at uh, what might be the effects of microsaccades on attentional modulation. Our lab did that. I did that, okay, the, that kind of analysis prior to 2016, 2017, uh, which is that if you do the analysis, what you also do is, oh, I detected a microsaccade. And then I'll line up my neural activity data, and then I'll average all that, and then I'll get like, oh, I don't see any effect. It looks flat. But we never bothered to look at the direction of the microsecond. When we started separating based on the direction of the microsecond, whether it's towards the intended target or back to the fixation, which is what we call as a way, that flat lining that you saw in the in the onsets, uh, uh, in, in, when you line up the firing date with the, the microsecond onsets, suddenly the picture changes. You see something like this, where I'm saying it's first microsecond, but I'll get to that. If the microsaccade was towards the object, <coughs> you see an enhancement in the neural firing activity. <coughs> and this I say is the first microsaccade because I look at all the microsaccades that happen during the trial, every trial, and then I give you the average. But this is just looking at the first microsaccade that happens immediately after the stimulus and cue are on. That is the attention period. So I detect the first ever microsaccade immediately when the attention period starts. And then I look at the direction of that microsecond, whether it's towards the target or away from the target. Because the animal doesn't know when the stimulus is going to come. So it's not expecting where when the, the stimulus is going to come, right? So what happens is with the first microsecond, when it is towards the intended target, is when you start seeing the, the attentional modulation that you saw that full stimulus V4 data that I showed you. It begins only after the very first microsecond happens. That is towards it. If the first microsecond was away, you don't see a difference between the attention in and attention out condition. There is no separation. It's still inattentive in that in a neural signature of attention sense, the animal is not attending, or there is no reflection of attention in the animal as far as the tag cued location is concerned. Okay. Is there is there a reason there starts to be a separation like immediately after the microsecond onset? Yeah. Instead of yeah. That's just different firing rates, averaging, all that, but not really. You actually see something, you don't see this. It's always after the microsecond. I don't see it. Oh no, I, I mean zero like, for, is, from is, zero. Yeah. So like the eye movement happens and then there's like no delay for well, there are so many problems here, right? The jitter is a big problem that I have to deal with. So this is only on average I can say this. Jitter is a huge problem which we fully can't deal with. So you will see some that doesn't look exactly lined up. But if those are some variety of error bar around the line, it does look like within you know, 10, 20 milliseconds, 
you're getting a difference in yep. uh, firing rate. Yep. yep. Which. Yep. Uh, that's, I, that's why I don't want to make a full on mechanistic like claim as to exactly how the things are yeah. getting there. So, and yeah, so this is what we observe. I'll show you even more evidence. I just gave you the big summary. I'll, I'll, I'll expand this more. How big is, how big is the receptive field? Uh, it can, it can cover the whole uh, object. Uh, I'll show you also control experiments where I can show you that this is not a retinal shift issue. Uh, this is not caused by retinal shift. This is an extra retinal mechanism. This is not simply uh, the animal making a microsecond, more of the object or less of the object comes in, and that's why I see that enhanced activity. We did a control experiment where instead of animal attending to anything, um, go to the uh, let's see if I can but if, if I fixated the target at this point would would activity in the receptive field drop down because uh -huh. I've moved the target out of the receptive field could you repeat it again sorry so if, if, if I um, instead of making a, a micro saccade to the stimulus if I actually moved my eyes to the stimulus would this particular cell go down to zero because I've now moved out of yes. the yes okay. yes it will uh, I'll just show you the. Uh, I thought I'll I'll show the control after this, but I think it's a good time to show that the, this is definitely not a, a retinal mechanism, in the sense that it's not the shift that has caused it. Uh, so I a bunch of control experiments before. Uh, people could say these modulations are simply uh, that are correlated with these microsaccharide direction onsets can just be explained because the eye has moved, it's in the fixation, so the object has gone within it or outside it and all that stuff. And that's enough to explain. So we did a, a kind of artificial microsaccad uh, experiment with these animals. What This was a passive viewing task where the animal was to fixate at the central location. No cue was presented. The animal has to just fixate. The objects were presented in different locations. And at a random time period, we what we did was we looked at the statistics of how what is the most you know uh, the histogram of the amplitudes that was most prominent in each of these animals it was around 0.3 to 0.7 degree uh, amplitude saccades and they lasted about 300 milliseconds so we recreated that and when we artificially jerked either towards by that amount for that time period or away for that time period so if that was to happen, then the retinal shift should explain how the modulations are different for the in versus out. When we did that, we didn't find any difference. They looked the same. The bump was there, the, the, the activity elevated, but it was the same for whether the, the, the artificial microsaccade like jerking was away or towards. So this was when we kind of knew that, okay, this can be simply explained as purely uh, a retinal process. There's some extra retinal aspect going on in the sense that the oculomotor system is involved in the cognitive process itself. Uh, I'll go back now. I think yeah. Rupu, essentially nothing, but how does anesthesia affect microsecurs? Uh, I don't know about anesthesia, but so the lesion that I performed in pulvinar, uh, not trust me here, uh, Weiwei, the, the first pulvinar paper. Uh, so Weiwei did a bunch of lesions in the lateral nucleus. That's what I'm showing over here. I'll, I have data later in for pulvinar and IT as well. Um, when he did the lesion in the lateral pulvinar, something very interesting happens. Uh, I don't know about anesthesia. It's almost, when you give that, the gain in activity in V4 is almost sleep-like. The animal's neural activity respond, uh, resembles more what you would observe when the animal is asleep. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's anesthesia, but it's a different state entirely. Uh, and the overall attention is completely down. So it's inattentive in that sense. Right. In the lateral pulvinar, if mm -hmm. it's in the medial pulvinar, something very interesting happens. Um, the There is no gain reduction, but the animal's ability to see is completely lost. Mm -hmm. Like it is hemifield negative, literally. Like the animal just struggles. Mm -hmm. Like I, first day I did the experiments, I was like having my regular uh, on the side or that side. The guy couldn't do any trials. He can't get the juice. He was struggling. In the middle of the experiment, I had to stop the whole thing. I had to change the stimulus to be like, at least she has to respond to one side of the location because he'll at least get like one, one third of all the trials correctly. Because the entire hemi field that, he, that has been uh, like lesion 
he couldn't attend. He couldn't move his eye. He was just like stuck. Mm-hmm. His eye movements were like just all over the map in the fixation window. He was just like struggling. He couldn't make a saccade to the right. He couldn't saccade. He couldn't direction. saccade. He couldn't saccade. But he could saccade the other way. Yeah. Wow. In the Palvinar, it's not in the superior colliculars or anywhere. So it's very strange. So Talvinar is a very in- insane place. Uh, uh, these really don't know much. Uh, but yeah, I don't know about anesthesia. It's very hard to say. But I think from the literature that I've seen, um, when you are anesthetized, um, I don't know about the microsaccad role there. The activity in V4 is almost comatose, non-existent. So I Okay, so yeah, that's the first result. But the very first microsaccade is when you see this neural signature of attention. So I, I just use the word like it essentially kickstarts the attentional process. Like you can think of it in uh, like dynamical systems terms. Like it's sort of like there is no difference in condition between attending in and attending out until I make a microsaccade in the intended target direction. It's almost like a critical phase transition that happens. That's when the attention begins and you kind of go after that. Well, the the alternate view would be that if I was um, attending more to uh, that location, I'm more likely to fire off a micro saccade in that direction. Yes, so I I want to avoid the notion of causality here. Yeah, well, but your last sentence very much did not avoid. Except for the first micro saccade, because I don't see it otherwise. Every other micro saccad, I am ready to. Uh, I, I go with this whole perspective that I don't have a cause, a causal view of it. What causes is the is the, is the act modulation in the attention causing the micro saccad or the other way around? But for the very first micro saccad, yes, because I'll show you in the next slide. When I do look at pairs of the first micro saccad transitioning to the micro saccad away and so on, I actually don't see that transition of attentional modulation occur until the micro saccade is towards. So imagine a trial where I start, there is a stimulus in Q. The first micro saccade occurs about 50 milliseconds after the stimulus in Q. And let's say it's a, an away micro saccade. The attentional modulation is delayed until the first micro saccade towards occurs, which could be 350 milliseconds after that. It's entirely delayed until the very first micro saccade. Uh, happens at least as far as V4 correlates of attention are concerned. I can't talk about the organism, uh, the animal overall, but in V4, I don't see anything before the first microsaccade towards occurs in terms of the neural signature of attention. Yeah, but the, the, the causality thing still uh, runs either direction, right? It could be that you don't see a microsaccade until attention is deployed. Yeah, but again, the other way around is equally true, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they just don't, you just don't know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so that was the uh, first microsecond, <laughs> okay. And this is just pairs looking at like just the very first microsecond and then the microsecond after. You see that here, there is a first microsecond is, and again, at 100 milliseconds is when I see the peak. Uh, it could be the delay, integration, all that stuff. Um, maybe the palvinar is the channel from where the neural information for from superior colliculars or whatever is the um, micro saccade plan generator is giving the information. I'm very agnostic about it because if you look at the literature people have shown, uh, so again, people like Richard Crosless, who's at NIH and Ziad Hafed, and a few others have shown that you can have micro saccades generated in the superior colliculus, purely from the superior colliculus, which is where all the hormones are generated, but also plan for microsaccades can come from the frontal eye field as well. So it's sort of like, so I'm very agnostic as to the generator of the microsaccad. All I'm going to say is like that oculomotor system is involved. So on on that front, uh, the microsaccades between the two eyes I, are, I believe, correlated, right? Yes. Does that fit with the the pulvinar as the generator idea? So one source controlling both eyes equally? Uh, once, yes, yes. So but the anatomy supports that? Anatomy kind of supports, yes. Hmm. Uh, at least the pulvinar is the pathway to V4. 
observing the reform uh, modulation of the macro the, the, the ocular motor system is involved in a very big loop. So it's like you have the frontal areas involved. Mm -hmm. You have the, the sub, you know, the, the superior colliculars and all the mid collicular areas involved. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't, mm -hmm. but you can assume that the thalamus in the palpinar mm -hmm. is probably ensuring that it's, uh, again, this is just circumstantial mm -hmm. at that point. Yeah. I, I can't piece together mm -hmm. that story. Um, let me just make one other point. Michael, I don't know whether you were expecting to, to sit through the entire uh, presentation. But in case there were things that you needed to take care of uh, oh. for the, uh, no, for I the if I can extend my parking on my phone, I'm good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So okay. We would love to have you stay, but you. I just wanted to ask you to have the freedom. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. So yeah. So at least in the data that we see, we don't observe any attentional modulation occurring. I'm not saying attention is dependent on microscopy. I'm just saying the modulation in attention and the microsaccade occurrence seems to uh, line up, like in the sense that there needs to be the first microsaccade before I see the modulation for attention happening in V4. You're right, it's very possible that attention as a process, it could be from top-down areas that I have no idea about. But that is- what, what if you do the analysis the other way around? And you, I don't know if you can do this. If you collect, if, if you look at where you first pick up an attentional modulation, if you go back, do you always find a microsaccade? I do, yes. At least in the first one, I do. It, it, that's the thing. So if you filter all the trials on, I'm so how do you? How would you know when you got the first attention of each one? Well, that's the time thing that I'm trying to say here, right? Like, this is immediately. Oh, it's when the, when so the. You're using firing rate as well. Yeah, yeah, when the fire. If, so once the firing rate jumps up, you always see a. A microsecond. Yes. So yeah. So when I exclude the first microsaccade, that is looking at all the microsaccades after the first microsaccade, and I do this analysis, this is very standard. This is just, I'm, I'm, I'm making it a stand. This becomes a standard idea in the sense that it's not like the result. When the microsaccade is away, the attention just goes away. It doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. You see that there is more enhancement during the towards periods of the subsequent microsaccades. And then there's maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, depression or activity, but for the most part, it kind of perseveres. So it's sort of like the microsaccade is like refreshing and uh, enhancing the activity. And every time there is a microsaccade towards, there is an enhancement of activity. So that's what it shows. By the way, all the plots at the bottom are just modulation indexes. That's the common method that people use to evaluate how, uh, I should have gone to the very first figure, I should have said this. Um, these are called as this is just a histogram of attentional modulation index. That's just a way to quantify whether each neuron is modulating positively for attention or it is actually in attention. If it's a value above zero, it is more attentive. And if it's exactly one, it's super attentive. If it's minus one, it's negatively attentive. So that's the span. And on average, that's the median value that I show here. Um, and that's like a standard neurophysiological measure of how attentive a population of neurons in a given area are. Yeah, so I went through this part and- so you would want the AMI to be over <laughs> zero. Yeah, over zero, zero, especially for the attention in condition. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so either of them, I want it to be over or under. I want to see what's the effect basically. Mm -hmm. So if it's over, I know that it is there. For example, you still see something over here. For example, if you go to the very first one, you see a very, very low uh, for the microsaccade array. It's very, very tiny. It's like 0. 0.000, whatever. Uh, and it's also not significant. On the other hand, after the first microsaccade, subsequent microsaccades, even when the microsaccade is away, the attentional modulation perseveres. It, it's not collapsing every time I make a microsaccade. It's not it's not like going up and down. It goes up, 
it kind of goes a bit down, but then it enhances, goes to a baseline, enhances, goes to a baseline. You can think of it that. Is uh, the first micro being towards about as frequent as the first micro being? Yes, like? yes. I should have mentioned that it's almost 50-50. And this is just a summary of just the amplitude modulation in terms of all the cells, about 295 cells in, in these animals. Uh, and because I use a laminar electrode, I can also do laminar analysis. I have figures for every uh, every area in the brain, every, every like whether it's a supraglanular neuron or an infragranular neuron and so on. Uh, so this is just showing that with the first microsaccad, when the microsaccad is away, the modulation index is very, very low or little, while across the different, whether it's all neurons or just the superficial neurons or the deep neurons, it's quite high. And then when I exclude the first microsaccad and look at the subsequent microsaccads, of course, this gets boosted. The microsaccad towards uh, modulations get boosted. And the microsaccad away kind of comes up. So that's that modulation up and then baseline up, baseline. The baseline is high enough to be called, considered attentional versus the attentional out part. And I have very similar results for the pulvinar nucleus, as well as IT neurons in pulvinar and neurons in the IT cortex as well. Pulvinar, you maybe one might not be too surprised because the receptive field of the pulvinar neuron is only slightly bigger than the receptive field of the V4 neurons that we mapped. IT is quite surprising because the IT neurons pretty much span the entirety of this hemifield. The entirety of this hemifield, the IT neuron spans it. And despite that, a towards microsaccad of multiple objects gives me a better, a higher attention modulation for one of those objects than the other is quite, quite remarkable. Uh, I mean, I can show you the results if you want, or I can go to the next part because I have a lot more to say. <laughs> um, yeah, at some point. Anybody else but <laughs> okay, so enough of attention. Uh, I want to see what other benefits does this kind of micro saccade direction has during the attention process on other aspects of vision in the same task. Uh, so I'll be talking specifically, this is more or less only V4 firing rates. So I'll only be focusing on V4, area V4. So I wanted to see whether this actually, but the, there is some something that I can say about the effect of microsaccad and attention in terms of how, if there was a downstream area, again, I'm being very agnostic. If there is a downstream area from V4, if I look at the distinct microsaccad time periods, do I see an improvement in the representation of the stimulus or selectivity of the stimulus that I can make use of? And the people do neural networks, right? So if I had a linear readout or something of that in the next layer, would it be beneficial when I consider a full sustained attention that people typically do? Or would it be better if I have like microsaccad intervals and I look at what happens there? So that was what the main motivation. Um, again, as I said, I'm not the, the guy who's going to say that there's an encoder here and a decoder there. This is as if a downstream area is going to be benefited, which could be IT, because we previously also reported that IT neurons, when we do a very simple decoder, like an ANOVA, we were able to differentiate even in the entire hemifield of all three objects with very high clarity, a very high performance, which was the object that the animal was attending to. And so we knew we could do a better object recognition in that. So this one is more temporal in the sense like I want to look at the entire 300 millisecond time period post microsecond, what the uh, object decoder is going to look like. But before that, I need to have a baseline. I want to come, so I'm going to compare it to the full stimulus time period and see what happens. This is just your full stimulus time period. Like when the stimulus comes on, I do the uh, decoding analysis of the what object is there and what object is not there. <laughs> and I have to separate it by two different sessions because one, the object comes first, sorry, the queue comes first and then the of objects come next. So there's a huge, uh, you know, 
impulse response of the stimulus. The other one, I'm looking at the sustained time period where that thing has died off, basically. That stimulus response has died off. I'm look, only looking at the sustained time period when both the Q and the stimulus are present. So I have to do the separate analysis for even the full stimulus, right? Because I have those two sessions, Charlie. Hmm. Yeah, the, the two orderings. The, the two orderings here, right? If I do, uh, in this case, by the time the Q comes on, the impulse response is done. It's all in that in that part of the in this the in this up. part of the mm -hmm. uh, it's all here I see. on the other hand when the uh, the stimulus comes on second i have this part to counter as well uh -huh. so i have to have two different decoders these are very simple linear decoders okay nothing fancy <laughs> it's like the most vanilla decoder you can think of i'm not going for any fancy neural networks here But you're giving multiple units uh, as the input. All the units, two, uh, 282 units. So it's 80% of all the data mm -hmm. from these units. 20%, I completely keep it locked out. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you the results of that as well. Uh, so it's a tenfold cross validation with these 80% of the data that is trained. All the results I'm showing is for 80% of all that data. 20% is randomly. Mm -hmm. Taken off. Are these units all equally contributing to the equally. result or are they in common form of it? What do you mean equally contributing? Uh, so in the if you consider the 280 or however many units you have on the input as the as the components of the vector, the two They're input equal. vectors. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, but if you were to do like a weight matrix of how much each unit contributed to the classification decision. Uh, would you find that some units are kind of like the grad cam analysis for deep networks? Yes, you can do it, but I have, I've, I've normalized the the, the rate here. Mm. It's, it's with the rate firing rate itself. Okay, so I've normalized the firing rate, and all neurons see. Of course, all neurons are not the same. I'm not making that mm -hmm. case. Okay, I'll give you. I'll show you examples where, if you look at the raw firing rate for these neurons with respect to the different objects, they are all over the map. On the other hand, if I were to normalize it within every object preference for that neuron, and then I give it like uh, for the seven objects, these are all equally shown to all of them. So they're balanced in the number of objects that I've shown here. It's equal contribution at that level. Yeah. Again, as I said, I'm not doing a very fancy neural networky stuff. This is just to show that there is something very profound happening here that might be of interest to people. Um, so this is just your standard full stimulus interval about 1000 milliseconds uh, after the, this is the attention period, 1000 milliseconds of attention period. Not surprisingly, in the stim second system where you have a stimulus come on, the maximum amount of information is in the stimulus onset time period, attention versus inattention. And of course, these neurons have preference for one object versus the other. The system does a good job of uh, saying that there is a decoding performance possible. And this is the performance for all the objects. It's correct object they identified. It's quite high, 65% whatever. It's high for me. <laughs> uh, and not much less so for attention out, but it's still there because the stimulus is still there. So it can still decode. Okay. And of course, after that initial big flurry happens, what you might consider as the sustained attention part, which might start earlier, you see that by the end of it, it kind of drops down. It doesn't really have that thing. Uh, 17, 15, 100 by 7, roughly 15%, 14.3% uh, is chance level. The attention out condition drops to chance. The attention in condition is only slightly above in decoding. So this is for the Q first, stim second. For the Q, stim first, Q second, sessions, you see the, the the obvious answer, which is that uh, there is no decoding advantage uh, between attention in and attention out. Very little. It's slightly about chance because you're still paying attention. This is very much in line with the literature where in a spatial attention task, there is no real object uh, 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 tuning happening. People have shown spatial tuning of uh, neural activity happening, spatial spatial sharpening happening. The receptive fields get sharpened. Like that's what they like to say. 
but they don't observe any object or stimulus tuning. So this is the standard view. That is not the, the, what I'm showing here is just uh, what any other attention results will show. But then when I do the same decoding analysis for microsecond intervals, I don't see that picture. I see completely something completely different. When there is a microsecond towards, or the periods wherever I look at the microsecond towards intervals, and I look at for those 300 millisecond time period, I see post microsecond an improvement in the decoder performance, and it's sustained for that entire like 300 millisecond period, starting roughly around the 100 millisecond period, only for the microsecond towards condition to a large extent, and more positive for the microsecond away condition as well, the attention in microsecond away condition as well. On the other hand, for the attention out, it's below chance. It doesn't see anything. Yet. Like I can't decode what my object is in the receptive field if I'm attending there, make a microsecond back and forth. I don't gain any information here. Why is there a signal before zero? Why is there a signal before zero? This is averaging effect. I, I look at the whole window. Like I don't look at just 300 milliseconds. I take 100 milliseconds prior yeah. and 300 milliseconds after. Yeah. So, but why is there, if, if, if attention is somehow gated to the micro saccade? Yes, because there, this is what, I, what am I doing? I've, on, I've artificially chopped up the data, right? So you can imagine that this is what is continuing over here or this is what is continuing. So there, there's a sort of a baseline level of attentional activation that, that you're saying. Yes, this is not, the, I'm not arguing against attention here. I'm saying in the presence of attention. It's and getting a little boom. Yes. For the microsecond. Here I'm not, the, I'm not separating the effect of attention. I'm just saying, if I look at the microsecond triggered intervals with attention, does it have any benefits towards object selectivity? The standard view in spatial attention is there is no object selectivity happening with just spatial attention. But temp within or sub temporal uh, blocks have information that is useful. Sort of like you can think of it in a purely temporal context. Like there is something happening. Um, whenever my, I make a microsecond towards, there is more information that could be used by the guy downstream to do something. And then it'll kind of go down. So this is kind of like, a sample as attentional sampling plus microsecond saying that there is an object selectivity component. And yeah, so that's the uh, decoder performance. That's not for the testing of how good it is. That's what I did with the held out data, the 20% of the held out data that never saw, like it's not part of the cross validation, none of that stuff. This is your, uh, this part, the green one is the uh, the Q first stim second when the stimulus comes on that you see that huge decoding that you see with the stimulus response. This is its test data. And this is for the microsecond intervals where you do see for both the microsecond towards and away, the decoder actually classifies the firing rate correctly or assigning it correctly to this object in the receptive field versus that object, one of the seven objects. And it's about 50%, 51% was the maximum. So in a way, what, what's happening is the <laughs> microsecond towards and microsecond away conditions during the attention in period are sort of refreshing the transient stimulus response, onset response. Mm -hmm. Sort of like you can, the drops are fading kind of effect. It's sort of like you make the microsecond towards, it refreshes the sensory stimulus, which might have otherwise disappeared. And as a result of which, even within an, a spatial attention context, you are actually observing object selectivity. And in the other condition, the sustained condition, you see it quite below chance in, in both the cases. So it's not doing well. And this is just a plot of uh, the stimulus tunings. I've removed the error bar because it looked kind of like confusing with so many of them. Um, this is just the stimulus tuning by looking at like, what is the most preferred object uh, that each neuron likes? What's the least preferred object? I do a rank ordering and then I look at the firing dates and then I plot the average for the different 
conditions that I just mentioned. Like if you look at the full stimulus sustained, which is what people typically look at, that's where they say that there is no object selectivity that is happening, which is this pink curve. You see that, that it's quite flat uh, for the preference of objects. For the thousand milliseconds that I look at during the sustained time period of attention, the pink thing is saying whether it's attention in or attention out, uh, there is no real uh, object selectivity in an attentional task. But, but if you were to look at the towards and away microsecond trigger intervals, you see this difference in selectivity. And that's what I'm showing in, in red versus uh, red over here and then blue versus blue over here. And the green is that full stimulus, the, the transient stimulus response, which is the highest firing rate that you observe. But this is kind of doing a refreshing of that firing. So you are getting a lot of benefits by having micro saccades and attention in a spatial attention context to actually discern what the object might be, at least in this very simple setting. And this is a very novel uh, uh, outcome because as far as I know in the literature, everyone, whenever they talk about spatial attention, they say that there is no component of feature or object selectivity happening. It's always said as this is a separate mechanism from the other. But we are saying that even within a spatial attention paradigm, if you look at the different time periods, you do see these profound effects. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm almost done. Okay, so this is just examples of a few neurons. Uh, I have uh, 280 such neuron. Uh, just looking at the attention in condition, just take one example maybe. Uh, they are arranged from in color coding from blue being the least preferred for the, that neuron to red being the most preferred for that neuron. Mm -hmm. And as you, if you can look at the scale, it's all over the map. Some neurons have 70 hertz firing, some neurons have 10 hertz firing, some neurons have 50 hertz firing. Mm -hmm. They're different, it's, a, it's mixed in terms of how they fire. But what you do observe is there are different profiles for the micro saccade away condition and micro saccade toward condition. What is the most preferred object in each of them kind of differs. And that might be used quite, that differential object selectivity might be a downstream benefit for IT or other areas which are involved in object recognition. Uh, but my goal is I hope I've at least partially convinced you that micro saccades are very crucial. Plus there are added benefits to looking at the temporal dynamics as attention unfolds towards ideas like object recognition, because right now we are in the midst of neural networks where the temporal domain has kind of been thrown out of the picture in many ways. But there is a lot of important uh, dynamical processes that are involved in object recognition. And I hope uh, at least I partially convince people that uh, this is quite important to follow through on. Uh, so how, how close these neurons? How close these neurons are? I mean, this is the I, I said neuron one, neuron six. Yeah. These are the, I just picked them up randomly here. Um, They're within the same. Number. These are <laughs> uh, uh, okay. In that sense, yes. Okay. So uh, one of the two. No, 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 no. no. Uh, so, so these neurons, if you look at them, it is I do a laminar recording. Yeah. So I go through the entire uh, uh, the, uh, the thickness of the cortex. So I measure neurons which are deep all the way up. They are, it's hard to say what is exactly a neuron here because we just go by the activity of the, it could be multiple neurons. It could be a multi-unit activity. It could be a single unit activity. It is very hard to always separate them. I have ensured that I have really good activity. That's all I have ensured in my pre-processing of neurons and all that stuff. Awesome. Um, roughly, uh, these neurons are on a, col on a column, a cortical column. Yeah. So I can measure six, I have 16 channels in my recording. So let's say I can measure ideally at least 16 cells on any session. Yeah. That usually doesn't happen. Uh, some channels don't pick up many cells or those are not easy for me to do spike sorting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, What's your analysis based on the collective 
behavior of these neurons rather than yes. specific yes. neurons. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the only place, so only place where I have shown anything. Okay, so this is the only analysis where I have done where this is slightly, this is still collective, but it's still preserving something about the cortical uh, anatomy, which is that this is looking at the same data for V4 neurons, but separating them based on where they are in the laminar uh, cortex. Lamina of the cortex. V4 has six layers, roughly. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't do a fine six layer separation. I need extra information for that. I have to either do histology and look at where the demarcations are. But there is a, an alternative way to do it, which is that I can look at the local field potential that I'm also measuring. We know one thing from looking at the, like the local measure of what you get in G. Uh, I can look at the, I can compute the current source of those channels. And usually the channel which gets the input is uh, the channel which has the first sync whenever there is a stimulus on set. So that's usually if you do neuroanatomy, you will find that it's layer four of uh, most of the uh, uh, networks or most of the areas. So I identify which of the 16 channels is actually having the first sync. And then anything above that, I call it Supragranular, anything below that I call it, call it infragranular, and that's the granular or input layer. Uh, so I can make that separation and do that analysis for um, the attentional part. Like, despite the fact that I did linear decoders, it's still little less, much less data than what you would require to train. You know, it's hard. I don't have the luxury of uh, having millions of uh, data samples, despite the fact that this is a huge data set. I don't have the luxury of millions of data samples. So I have to. Uh, work with what I have. So it's I'm limited by, it's gargantuan data for me personally, but it's not gargantuan data for a linear decoder or a neural network to work with. So I'm fundamentally limited by what kind of analysis I can do. Um, so yeah, uh, that's mostly, yeah, so. Sorry, sorry but how do you define uh, which object is preferred by? You? Just the highest firing rate, just the highest firing rate. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't want to jump in until you got hit your conclusions here. So. Oh, so, conclusions are yeah. the first part of the conclusions is not very uh, uh, controversial. Uh, <laughs> Charlie wanted me to make it controversial. So the second slide is controversial. Uh, the first one is just me summarizing whatever I've said. Uh, so, <laughs> all right, we'll look at <laughs> what the So, I mean, whatever I said, I mean by my empirical evidence of it. Uh, so attentional modulation, uh, this is what I've shown, and even in a co sustained covert attention task seems to be kickstarted by the microsaccade direction towards the intended target. As I said, mechanistically, I like to think of this as a critical phase transition from a dynamical systems perspective. I don't know exactly the mechanism. There are multiple ways to think about it. Uh, these modulations and enhancements are perceived they seem to persevere for the entire duration of the trial with the subsequent micro saccades, where I see both enhancements and sustenance of the mod attentional, attentional modulation. And they seem to be observed in varying degrees across V4, IT, and Palvinar. Uh, I've only showed it for V4. I have data in this next set of slides for IT and Palvinar, same set of analysis that I showed for V4 for both IT and Palvinar. Um, and again, with the decoder results, there are distinct decoder performances and uh, stimulus selectivity that seems to happen. And as I mentioned, it seems to be usually obs obscured when you just look at the entire thousand milliseconds, look at attention in and attention out. You say, oh, there is no space. There is only spatial tuning. You, you might see your receptive field kind of sharpen and uh, reduce in size. So you become more focused, uh, but no real uh, object or stimulus selectivity. So there's no feature attention kind of happening. Uh, I think uh, I would say that is one of the very strong results of our paper by saying that it's there is something to be said about feature attention occurring within such intervals as well. Um, and as I mentioned, the consequence of that is the MS towards with attention. Again, I'm not saying it is separate from attention. With attention seems to refresh the transient stimulus onset response, 
that is shaping the stimulus selectivity in different regimes. Uh, now I can make uh, Jeremy get angry. Uh, the next part is now. So the like again, this is not very controversial. This is just me like being agnostic and saying it might have downstream benefits of object decoding and so on. If I were to look at the MS triggered intervals, um, one of the main things that I hope I have at least partially convinced most people is that. Uh, these microsaccades are not very involuntary in the sense of how we make eye movements. You might, I don't want to get into conscious versus unconscious and all that stuff. Given that these are, I at least want to get rid of the notion that they're random artifacts, they're, they're completely involuntary. There seems to be some kind of a distribution that says there is more information that they convey than what people typically attribute them to. Uh, and the next one is something that I completely left out because I only presented firing rate data. I have not shown anything with respect to the data that I have on local field potential. And uh, so that's like your EEG signal locally for people who don't do neurophysiology. Um, we have very interesting data there where we can actually show that unlike what most people present as attentional sampling, uh, ha happening because of rhythms of uh, theta and uh, riding on gamma riding on theta or whatever. We don't, we actually have a very different worldview where we, th the, one of the big problems I've always had with that, their approach to synchronization of how these different areas get to perform attention is how, how on earth are these individual areas doing all those crazy stuff, synchronizing on the go? Like if this, if some activity is going on here, some activity is going on here, how are they able to synchronize quite readily unless they're all looking at the same entrained signal of some sort? But when we look at the world, there is no, no, I mean, the best way to get rhythmic behavior is if there is rhythmic input. But the world is not really rhythmic in its input. So that's always been deeply troublesome for me. So I've not really bought much of the ideas on synchronization, looking at like I correlated LFP in this area and then this area and all that. Uh, what we observe here is that, or at least we, I believe, is that uh, the microsaccad is kind of like a, an almost global signal. I'm not saying microsaccad is the only global signal. In shifts of attention, the saccad is a global signal with a ma massive move. And I can actually go further and say that this could be attributed even in other modalities. For example, in, when it comes to touch, it's sort of like the same microsaccad, the whiskers that uh, the mice have. You look at them, they're never always stable. They always have these min minute uh, whisker movements that they make. So the microsaccades, these whiskers are kind of all in the same ballpark that are helping to coordinate and synchronize across regions. So I've left this analysis out, but uh, I've shown Charlie some of them. Uh, but we have, uh, if I presented, you'll probably kill me. Uh, you'll be here for the next three hours. <laughs> um, Did you pull up like one slide? Okay. I don't have it here. Uh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, that's why I've left it out. But we, we believe that uh, the micro saccades and saccad like systems are global temporal synchronization signals. So, this is the other thing. The, there is a huge concentration in the LFP world in the frequency domain. There are uses to it, but I think people have gone overboard. Again, my personal worldview. And as a result of which they're building theories that I don't think are relevant to how you would deploy them in say pathologies, especially for pathologies, because I'm very interested in these eye movements and vision and most of us are uh, in, in such pathologies. Like for example, I think this is controversial by the way, Jeremy. Uh, uh, mostly I, 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 would, I, I want to hope that the kind of stuff that I'm talking about with respect to microsaccades is such that it can be used as a biomarker in the same way that people have used saccadic movements to look at people with Parkinson's disease and so on and predict that they have severe problems or they can predict with some certainty that there is a likelihood that these people might have Parkinson's-like syndrome. I hope something like that can be done with microsaccades as well. Again, that's my hope, not saying that it's true. Um, yeah, so I've left that part out, the whole local field potential data and analysis, um, but it's very interesting in 
I don't think attention is a rhythmic process. I agree on the fact that it's a sampling process. It is not continuous in the way that we thought originally as like a spot spotlight of attention kind of worldview. We have to refine that spotlight of attention worldview to have the sampling like approach. But is it rhythmic? I don't think it is rhythmic. Uh, quite for various reasons, including the fact that the world is not rhythmic. Microsaccades are not occurring at any rhythmic uh, uh, frequency. Uh, so something has to go. <laughs> uh, finally, this I, I kind of presented only my results here, but there are people after we published our very first paper actually corrob corroborated a, a large aspect of the stuff that I showed you with respect to microsaccade modulated uh, directions modulating the attentional uh, activity. So Crossless and his lab actually recreated it. Uh, um, this is again Marquette data. Ziad Hafed had recreated it. I mean, that's good for us uh, that they were uh, that they took us seriously. They don't agree with us on everything, but they at least agree uh, to the extent that microsaccades are relevant. To that extent, we have at least changed the team. Um, there's a very interesting study that came out last year in humans where uh, Anna Nobri and uh, I don't know how to say his name, Frickman Eid uh, is a big uh, uh, EEG person working in humans and studying attention. Uh, they did this EEG study, EEG or MEG, I'm not even sure, uh, in humans, and they looked at alpha lateralization, which is a sign of attention. And they found that the microsaccad kind of has that correlation with the direction. Direction of the microsaccad has correlation with reduction in alpha uh, lateralization, even in humans. Uh, the one thing where we have all disagreed or still open is that they've said like that. We also observe attentional modulation in periods where we don't see any microsecond. But for me, from a very purely empirical point of view, I don't even know where, where when to say that there was no microsecond or not. A, there is a microsecond. Like the previous microsecond could have continued and the effects of that could continue all the way up to like 500 milliseconds or 700 milliseconds and the next microsecond will change it. I don't even know how to evaluate it because again, this is not rhythmic. These are happening in quasi periodic intervals. So I don't even know how to answer such questions when like, for example, Cross just looked at a 200 millisecond interval and there was no microsecond. My question is there was a microsecond 300 milliseconds before that. Maybe it's an effect of that. So how are you saying that there is no effect here? So I don't know how to answer that question. And finally, this is the thing that uh, I said to Charlie, this is me believing in something. I'm not saying that this is true. Um, uh, this is like my zealot behavior, uh, where I think uh, I sincerely believe that covert visual attention is coupled with ocular motor system. So cognition and action are not entirely separable. What I mean is, uh, these are again a dynamical systems language. If I have two two areas, they are all connected to one another. Me talking about all causality of what cost what is not a really meaningful thing. To, the whole system is the causal system in that sense, and that goes towards a very active sensing and attentional sampling view of cognition. What do I mean by that? That's the example that I gave with the whisker, where the animal is actively sensing and then sampling the regime in which it is sensing, and then it goes about, find something useful, and then that serves as the basis for the next uh, time window and so on. So, uh, and I think that's true even for us when we do our touch system. If I just touch my hand, I don't, if I just use this to touch my hand, maybe I don't get much information. I do a bit of this, or my hand does a bit of internal movement or whatever. I want to save my computer. I don't care about me. <laughs> <laughs> See, the oh, computer so likes yeah. <laughs> yeah. computer. All right, so, so yeah. I, 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 yeah, so I got a question. Thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. work that I did in collaboration with other people, Stav uh, Yeah, I did do a lot of the work, but Eric is very important. He's the guy who kick started everything. Uh, he has way more data in V1 and V2 as well. So, um, yeah. All right, so, so here, here's an alternate idea. Uh, I've got, I'm, I'm fixating here. Okay. I'm attending to you. Okay. And, so, and I know I'm eventually, because you're only going to give me a drink if I do this, <laughs> I got to make a saccade to you. So I'm, I'm planning a, a saccade. Um, and I'm planning a saccade like four times a second. Uh, 
I know I can't release the saccade until you give me the magic signal. But if I'm planning a saccade, we know that I'm going to deploy attention here and I'm going to enhance my performance yep. here. Uh, wait, you, you can, why does it have to uh, then become attention? It could need not, right? This need not serve that purpose, right? Like, well, if, 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 I, if I plan a, uh, a saccade that I don't release, I nevertheless get an enhancement of processing at the mm -hmm. location of the saccade. Right, people like Eileen yeah. Power have been yeah. doing that for a hundred years at this point. Um, so I planned the saccade. It's time to release it because it may not be exactly on a clock, but four times a second or so, I'm going to make some sort of saccade. But I've got this break on it that says I can't release it, um, except that that break is imperfect. Mm -hmm. And I cheat a little bit in the direction of the, that the saccade was going to be. And the guy who's recording from my brain, he's all excited because he thinks that's a micro saccade, but it's just a, a, a side effect of planning a regular old saccade, which I'm going to keep doing throughout this whole period while he's making me wait. I'm going to keep cheating this way a little bit. And when, uh, when I discover I've cheated too far, I'm going <clears> to <throat> saccade back because otherwise the guy who's giving me the juice gets mad at me. But the, 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 the micro saccades in this story would simply be um, a, an epiphenomenon of the, uh, of, of the larger scale saccade planning yes, network. Yes, I, I don't have a problem with that. But if that's the case, why do you see a difference in the micro saccades with the attention deploy deployment at the very, very beginning? I mean, uh, at the very beginning of uh, the first microsecond has to be towards for the modulation to start. Or the module once the modulation has started is when you get the first microsecond. Well, at least in the neural level, I can't differentiate that. Yeah, I can't either. Right, I, it, but as a, as a saccadic I, epiphenomenon, I'm fine with it. But as a covert attention thing, then it's saying that you have always not taken into consideration that eye movements are always happening, right? With, with respect to the attention part. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that there's a lot of people who would not accept the notion that the ocular motor system and the attention will- No, they the say that they, 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 that one, it, one, one, one comes after the other is the traditional version. Like it's only for the shift in attention, I deploy my Ocular motor system. That's the typical world. Right. And and the other piece of it would be that I can make multiple covert deployments of attention um, without necessarily deploying the the eyes because yeah. covert attention is capable. Uh, we can get into nice serial parallel arguments, but but I can process objects in the scene much faster than. Uh, for three or four a second, right? Yeah. I can't. I can only move my eyes three or four times a second, but I can you know, go through twenty or thirty objects per second. So they're not all generating micro saccades. But if I force the, uh, if I force where I'm putting my covert attention, then it, it makes sense to me that we would bias. Um, yeah, the, the micro saccades. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we're in massive agreement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to have a, a truly controversial bullet point at the end of your talk. Something like the brain of the vestigial organ. Oh my God. In the liver. Uh, okay. I'm not going that far. <laughs> I'm not going that far. I think I, if, uh, the, the, I think the one that I didn't show is the one that will ruffle the neurophysiology people the most. Uh, mm. that, that that local field stuff where the that rhythmic worldview mm. is the one that I find very problematic. Mm. Um, why why do you have a problem? I mean, I I don't happen to be a a a big fan of of, of the rhythmic stories either, particularly. But why is it a problem that the world isn't rhythmic? We can perfectly well have oscillators. In oscillators the doesn't. They are looking at harmonic oscillators, right? So it's a big difference. That, that's a, that, that's not a, the, the oscillators are complicated. That's no problem. They are. Uh, that seems like a safe. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, what I mean is, 
five. Okay, if I go back to like what I know in nonlinear dynamical systems, oscillations which are nonlinear are what we should be looking at. The way they process their data and do their analysis is actually over simple harmonic oscillators. What do they do? They do a Fourier transform, yeah. they filter, they get sine waves out of it. The minutest perturbation of the sine wave collapses the system. I, I got no problem with that because I never. I know I didn't say I am against oscillation. I yeah, said oh, okay. I'm against you're, the, you're... the particular be rhythmic behavior that they are suggesting. Oscillations are underlying this process that I'm talking about in local field potentials. There, there's, there should be a difference between rhythmicity and oscillatory behavior. I'm not against the oscillatory behavior part. But if you look at the, the strong suggestions that a lot of people have made, whether it's Sabina Kastner or even Earl has made those ideas, that's not stemming from purely oscillatory behavior. They're looking at a very narrow strand of uh, what they mean by oscillation. It's the simplest strand of oscillation that you can think of. It's a linear, stationary, blah, blah. it has linearity, stationarity, all those assumptions built into it. Isn't that kind of like at a, at a much longer time scale saying, yeah, yeah, there's a circadian clock that's running at about 24 hours. And yeah, we know you don't fall asleep at exactly the same time as a lot of other. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't question periodicity. I didn't question oscillation. I didn't question any of that. Yeah. I'm questioning the, the very simple harmonic behavior. That's right, but if you if you were to go, you know, and do your uh, the, the circadian thing by running a Fourier analysis on it and saying, "Oh, looky, looky, I have a signal at with a twenty-four hour or maybe twenty-five hour sine wave on it," yeah, that's not saying that. I don't think there's anything complicating it. It's just saying that there's an underlying dead simple. Why am I sitting around defending these guys? I don't believe this stuff, but but I think that's what they would say, that they wouldn't be saying, look, I, I, I don't really believe that all of behavior is running off of an alpha or a theta or whatever sine waves somewhere. Uh, I think they are saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're very much saying that. Well, it depends how much you give to drink. <laughs> They're very much saying that when they say that, oh, my, uh, your gamma is riding on an alpha. Or, I'm not making this up. They say exactly the stuff that I said. Well, Jeremy, wouldn't you need to know where the eyes were? The eyes don't know where they are. Well, they don't know perfectly where they are. But I know that I'm looking at Ron's nose. <laughs> and if I you know, if I drift off that or micro saccade off that, I can I can make a corrective saccade. Actually, can you tell the difference between micro saccades and corrective saccades? Is there no. any easy way to no. do that? No, not in this kind of uh, no. paradigm. No. I'm just making it a very simple binary between. <laughs> one going towards the fixation, one going away from the fixation. Right? So I can't make that corrective versus unless I have forced. Will I do that? I have to have an anti saccade, all that stuff. Come in. You know, I have to instruct the animal, like if I make a saccade in this direction, make a saccade to that target over there at the other side, kind of to say it's a corrective saccade of some sort. I'm just know. wondering from the, you know, the, the, the actual targeting. High movement literature, whether the size of the the size and dynamics of corrective saccades look like micro saccades. They might the the corrective saccades are usually smaller than the original saccade. That well, yeah, sure. But I don't know whether I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to answer. Paul, this is making me wonder. Like, do you know what happens to micro saccades in blindness? Oh, yeah. hmm. No idea. It's a good question. Very good question. No idea. Yeah, I was going to ask, what pathologies do you think you would find? What are your hypotheses? Well, there was a recent uh, paper, which actually this is something that I've been reading about. Uh, there was a recent paper which was looking at both PD, uh, Parkinson's disease, and uh, also uh, autism. And they found that there were, they've already shown stuff 
with respect to Parkinson's disease and saccades overall. Uh, it's a very recent paper. If I have the link, I can show you its analysis. Um, they also did it for autism and uh, Parkinson's disease, and they were able to show that there are signatures of microsaccade, which are very different from a control sibling versus people who might be uh, classified as on the spectrum, not ASD, but like people with autism versus people with Parkinson's, you do see a difference in signature of uh, microsaccades. So, yeah. Do you see the world in some different way? That would be, I don't know, <laughs> that, just pathological studies, right? So, so it's harder to say how they can evaluate. I mean, the, I hope I have not convinced everyone by saying neurophysiology is the end all of everything here. I am firmly of the opinion that behavior, neurophysiology, psychophysics all matter. The fact is we have uh, it, the tendency in the field in neurophysiology is to run away with neurophysiology as a soul. That's one of the things by with my local field potential analysis and all of it. They don't look at the behavior, they don't look at the other mm -hmm. things that you can attribute. Uh, that's I the other like agree with you about that. <laughs> <laughs> and just so, think in a, in, a, in a year we'll find out whether or not there are micro saccades in, in uh, the Prakash. In the Prakash, right? right. Yeah, I, in fact, I'll be interested in that. It's all on you. In fact, I'll be interested in that. I'm serious about it. Like, it's like, I asked me about like six years back, I would have been like, what is micro mm -hmm. Nonsense. Like, uh, there's nothing to it. Like, I was the same guy. I was the guy who said this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Shame. jet lag, involuntary, mm -hmm. fixational movements, that's me. Yep. So uh, yeah. but the evidence doesn't say that. So uh, I hope there are some things that are there. And again, uh, the the dichotomy of microsaccades being something different from saccades itself is a false one. And in that sense, you're right with that epiphenomena that you mentioned. Um, and maybe the covert attention paradigm itself is sort of a very, very contrived way of actually talking about attention overall, given that we are forcing people to you know, fixate all the time, force them mm -hmm. to fixate, and then somehow mm -hmm. we are going to magically study the complete internal ruminations of uh, <laughs> our cognitive process. I think that might have to go. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Karthik, thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, we have to head out. No, but so, Lainey, uh, yeah. do you have somebody picking you up at the Delhi airport? Yes, that's yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. And where are you headed? That